I'm Ann Bocock and welcome to Between the Covers. Lori Roy is a champion storyteller and her work seems to fall at the intersection of Southern fiction and literary suspense. Her new book is a timely contemporary thriller with small town secrets and a family's dark connection to white supremacy. Please welcome the author of Gone Too Long, Lori Roy. Thank you. Thank you. I am so happy to have you I'm here. I'm thrilled to be here. First of all, let's talk a little bit about this prestigious Edgar Award stuff that okay. I know a little something about. I love to talk about that. I, I've known you for a while. Yes. I think I knew you when your very first book, Bent Road, came out. Yes. And you hit it out of the park with that. You win the Edgar Award, which is pretty amazing in mm -hmm. itself. And then a few books down the road, you win the Edgar again. again. And we're talking about the best in your genre. This mm -hmm. is what that the Edgar Award is. So you are the only woman to have ever won this twice. The only woman to win best first and then best novel. Yes, exactly. Yes. yes. I, I am. I, I didn't realize that until it was announced at the event. But uh, yeah, it was I, very I mean, exciting. That's, there's bragging rights right there. Well, sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, you know, the thing about writing that I've adopted for myself and I try to share with other, you know, maybe aspiring writers, it's always about the next book. It's always about it's the always next book. It's always about the next book. Before I get into the book, as long yes. as we're talking about prestige and awards okay. and good stuff like that. Let's keep it coming. You're now a cover girl. First, well. you're, on, you're, you're, <laughs> you're a cover girl of Mystery Scene magazine. Mm -hmm. The cover was yours. And then I see that Oprah magazine did a spread of books not to be missed, and there you are. Photo uh, shoot. Well, yes, I was included on the, I think it's 39 uh, books by women for the summer. Uh, terrific books on that list. And five of us were um, selected in collaboration with J. Jill Clothing. Some of you ladies might know J. Jill. And uh, to be their uh, inspired women. They have an inspired women campaign. And they've done this in various uh, lines, like they did musicians. And, um, and of course, I was in the group of authors. So the five of us were invited to New York and J. Jill hosted us in a, we all wore J. Jill clothes and um, nominated for our achievements in and inspiration in the field of, of writing as authors, but we were treated um, not like cover girl. I may be like well, cover girl. You were a cover it girl. Was, it was a lovely, it was a lovely event. It was a great experience. Um, right. A lot of pampering. A lot of pampering. Which is unusual in, in your world. Well, okay. usually it's, I, I'm in workout clothes, sweats, uh, my pajamas. And a lot of coffee. <laughs> and a lot of coffee, yeah. Let's talk Gone Too, gone too Long. Mm -hmm. This is very interesting. When I started the book, it's like I'm reading two stories. Chapter one, a child has disappeared, a girl mm -hmm. has disappeared. Chapter two, a woman comes home, young woman comes home to bury her father. Two very interesting starts to a book. Mm -hmm. But then it gets a little darker and a little deeper. Give me the backstory, if you would. Well, um, the backstory on the novel or the backstory right, on, on how I on came the novel, up with? On the novel first. Um, so the, the novel is the story of Emma Jean Coulter. Emma Jean's family has historic ties to the Ku Klux Klan. That, that idea, um, way in the beginnings, before the book was, uh, before I'd written a single word, came from Stone Mountain, Georgia, which many of you are probably familiar with. Um, at the time, my daughter was going to school in Georgia, and I came to learn about Stone Mountain and its history. Its history is very closely tied to the Ku Klux Klan, because in 1915, it was reignited there after sort of being squelched, the original iteration. So this is Emma Jean Coulter's family. Her father is the leader of his, the clan in his area, and very infamous because their family dates back to that group that in 1915 reignited the clan. So she has a very heavy history that she's carrying with her when she makes a harrowing discovery on the night of her father's funeral. 
and that discovery ties us to the young girl who disappeared seven years earlier. How much research did you do to learn about the Klan? Um, I, I did a lot. I, I, I did. It's a tough thing to research. I, um, as I mentioned, my daughter was in Georgia at the time, and I was spending a lot of time there. So did a lot of on-the-ground research just of Georgia itself, um, the towns of the area, a lot of historic buildings, uh, went wading through some swamps and fought off a lot of mosquitoes. Okay. So a, a great deal of that kind of research. I, I spoke with law enforcement about, because I had a great deal of knowledge of the history of the Klan but not so much about the present day. So I did have some law enforcement um, contacts that were kind enough to share with me some, uh, some very valuable insight. And there's a lot, you know, YouTube, there's so much on YouTube. And you can go out and hear uh, Klansmen and women speaking. You're, t you're talking present day. Yes, present day. What surprised you the most when you were, were getting this background information? Well, the thing that surprised me the most when, when I was doing all the historic research, one of the things that I quickly came to, to find, and it's pointed out by a lot of sources, it wasn't, I wasn't the one to uncover this, that there's been this ebb and a flow to white supremacy throughout history, that certain events will arise that cause it to sort of come out of the shadows, and then certain things happen where it kind of quiets down, but it's always there, simmering. And as I was researching the state of things today, um, I got to a point where I realized we were in another one of those um, rising tides of white supremacy. You reference the film, The Birth of a Nation. Yes. Which probably, at least I think, probably the most controversial film ever made in this country. Uh, I, I would agree. I would agree, and it was in the wake of that film that I believe, it's been a while since I've done this research, I believe the gentleman's name was William J. Simmons. It was in the wake of that film that he gathered up about 12 to 15 men and they marched up Stone Mountain and uh, reignited the Klan, which went on to grow to some 20 million members by the 20s, which that shocks a lot of people, but that's... What happened? That's, that's a huge number. Yes. Were, were you aware of the significance of, of, of the, wherever this started? Did, did, was this new to you when, when you started writing? Um, some of the history, such as uh, surrounding Stone Mountain, uh, I think for people who were born and raised in, in Georgia and Florida, that's probably <laughs> not, uh, well, I say, I, I say it's probably not new, but then I've talked to people who were raised in the area who didn't realize. Um, so in as much as I was very familiar with the Klan in general, I certainly learned a great deal. What's interesting, and I've read all of your books, this book has a contemporary setting. Yes. Not all of your books do. So I, I'm wondering what inspired this. I, I know that you have had to have written this book. Um, well, no, I, I'm not going to put words in your mouth. Mm -hmm. Did Charlottesville influence you at all? Uh, yes. Um, I started writing the book, um, it was about May of 2017. So that gives you some idea how long it takes for a book to get finished and come out. Um, and Charlottesville was in August of 2017. And it influenced me significantly. I, I didn't... Um, so you had already started the book. I, I was well into the book because I had a contract for this book. I had a deadline. So I was hitting the ground hard and writing, uh, had, had written a good deal of the book, in fact, by that time, a first draft. There's a big difference between a first draft and a finished product. Um, but yeah, Charlottesville had a, had a great impact on the book. I find that interesting. So here we are. You've already started the book. The nation is watching a white supremacist rally mm -hmm. in Charlottesville, and you decide to change things in, in, in where your book is going? Um, I'm not sure how much it changed 
the plot itself, if you think of the plot um, like the whodunit aspect of it. But it was, it gave me a unique understanding to my characters in a way that I went back and, and I was rewriting and rewriting. As I mentioned, I have a woman, Emma Jean, who is not in the Klan, has never been in the Klan, has never held to their beliefs, and yet many in her family do. And so how do you navigate that? that mm -hmm. That's a tricky thing. And then to see Charlottesville happen and to watch not only the horror that happened there, but also the responses around it. That informed, to me, it informed a great deal on where we were. And I'd been looking back at history and looking at this ebb and, a, and flow that has happened you know, since the late 1800s. And I'm, I'm watching it, realizing some writer like me 20 years from now, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, is going to look back on our time and think that was another time when there was a rise in white supremacy in the United States. Let's go back a little bit to, for instance, Harper Lee, who you have, people have compared you to Harper Lee, your, your writing. In To Kill a Mockingbird, that book takes place in the 30s. It was mm -hmm. written in the 50s. And during that time, Jim Crow laws were the laws of mm -hmm. the land. Your book, there is the, this, this close connection, as, as we said, to, to white supremacy, and yet your book is contemporary. Do I look at this, do you want me to look at this as a cautionary tale? I look at it as a cautionary tale. Um, that tells me a lot. Yeah, I, I think that one of the fundamental rules of fiction is show, don't tell. And which is if your character walks on stage and she has a beautiful dress on, you don't say she has a beautiful dress. You give the details that tell the reader, and then the reader decides, ooh, that's a beautiful dress, because then you really feel it. Um, and, and you believe it more, because you've seen the detail, or you've, the author has helped you see the detail. That's what I would apply to the whole novel. That's what I'd apply to all my work. It's not for me to tell someone what to think, because who, who, what do you care what I think? Um, but it, it's, I, I'm showing the world as I have saw it, particularly in the wake of Charlottesville. What's also interesting is your writing is eloquent, and yet you're telling me some terribly disturbing things mm. at the same time. That is an art. You don't just start doing it that way. Well, see, that's one of those things that, um, as a writer, you don't think too much about or you'll ruin it. <laughs> um, <laughs> So now it's going to be in my head, and I'm going to start. I'm so am sorry. I, am okay. I doing that? Because um, I want to do that. Well, thank you. Um, it, it's. Um, I, I'm, I'm always thinking about how to keep that plot going and how to keep my characters developing. And the one of the rules I, I got early on in my writing career is write the book you want to read. And that's a lot different than write the book you want to write. If any oh. of you are writers out there. Remember that. Um, and that's, that's what I try to keep in mind as I work every day. There is a certain feel to Southern literature. Mm -hmm. I'm a Southern girl by, by birth, so I get it. I cannot describe it to you. I don't exactly know what it is. You're not, but now this seems to be your lane. Um, yes, that Southern Gothic, I think, is, is what you're talking about there. I, I think it is. Uh, I, this is my fifth book, and I started, I'm from Kansas. My first book was set in Kansas. Southern but, Kansas? Uh, okay. uh, yeah, <laughs> Southern, which honestly, it's not altogether different than the South, okay. um, as I say with the Southern accent okay. that I've developed. Okay. Um, and then I, I wrote a book set in Detroit, and then I slipped down to Kentucky, so I got a little farther south, okay. and then Florida was my last book, and now Georgia. There, there is a, a, a beauty to Southern Gothic literature where the great um, Flattery O'Connor, of course, comes to mind, Harper Lee, to some extent. Um, all the beautiful things about the South, you know, the landscape, the architecture, the food, the music, um, is captured in Southern Gothic. And it butts up against the horrific history of the South. 
And the juxtaposition of those two things heightens both of them in a way that is pretty extraordinary. Are you happy in staying in, in this area now? You know, as long as they'll have me, I think so. Oh, I think they're gonna I have you. I think so. With Southern literature, in my mind, a sense of place is equally important to a plot and a, and a character, mm -hmm. and, and you've always felt that. Uh, yes, I am. Uh, most of my books, all except this one, have started with setting. I like a gritty setting. So it's a rural Kansas town with the dusty roads and the hard dry fields and the hot oppressive summer. Um, I think it was summer, maybe it was winter. The cold <laughs> oppressive winter. Um, the same 1950s Detroit, very oppressive culturally. Um, so I, I do, I have always searched for that. And it's why I spent, a, I wrote three books before I finally wrote a book in Florida, even though I was living in Florida that whole time, because the sunshiny state of Florida doesn't lend itself immediately to a gritty setting. Oh, uh, but yes, it does. But I found it. <laughs> I did find it. You don't write for women, but yet you really write about women. Mm -hmm. And usually they're not, there's a little madness or a little evil, and who doesn't like a woman who's a little mad, yeah. you enjoy that. Uh, well, sure, those are the best characters. Um, I, I, and I, I, don't, I don't approach my fiction thinking I'm going to write about women, um, but they are, their stories interest me. The book I wrote, 1950s Detroit, follows three women um, who are home taking care of their families, but who quietly find a way to exert the most power, even though it's the men who truly have it. Um, it's not necessarily the sort of power or strength that we think of when we celebrate it you know, in, in society as money or holding the big job, but these are strong women who overcome extraordinary obstacles. And that's, that's what interests me, that, that they have the most to overcome. And family secrets and dirty laundry, and who doesn't like to read about that? And well, you do that sure. so well. Well, thank <laughs> you. Um, it, well, we all have them, right? It's, it's what's closest mm -hmm. to home that we deal with quietly behind closed doors that no one knows about. So I try to go into that character. The, the thing about you know great fiction, and I, I'd hope that I can do this, is that when you read a book and you're in another person's point of view, you're in a character's point of view, you're inside that person. You know their every hope, their every dream, every fear, in a way that you don't for anyone else but yourself. Mm -hmm. So when you can read a book that's well done and be in that person's point of view, for that few moments you're experiencing the world as another person does, and that can build empathy and understanding and really change a person. Point of view, you like to write from different points of view. You, yes. you, and you really do enjoy that. I, I do. Um, this book has two primary points of view. Um, there's a, another couple that slip in there. Um, but, well, yeah, I, I, I love to be very close to the character. Um, I tried to try to be very careful not to overdo that because we've all read those books where I can't keep track of who's. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do work hard not to overdo that or to do it very carefully. Um, but it does allow you to really, as I was saying, slip into the point of view of that other person instead of having another character tell you about them. Which, they're, they're telling their own yeah, story. It's just not as interesting to me. I want to be inside. Gone Too Long is a novel, and yet there is a lot of truth in, in this book. The book you wrote before this book, The Disappearing, mm -hmm. this was based on some, a horrific thing that happened in, in the state of Florida. Yes. Yes, um, The Disappearing is based on the Dozier School for Boys, if any of you are familiar with that. Um, it's up in Mariana, near Tallahassee. And for the 100 years that school was in operation, starting from about the second year it was open, there were um, horrific 
abuses that were taking place and basically nothing was ever done about it. And then um, I know people are familiar with the story, so I don't want to spend too much time. But it's interesting because it's just come out in the news that they are actually going to now evaluate the entire property in search of new graves for more children who were killed there. Horrible, They've already horrible uncovered 50-some. But So you read about this, obviously, in the news. You found it compelling and said, I, I'm going to, this is my novel. Well, I followed that. That started... 10, 12 years ago. Um, I live in St. Petersburg and the St. Pete Times, it was the St. Pete Times at that time, it's the Tampa Bay Times now. Uh, ben Montgomery is a journalist, was a journalist there who covered that story extensively. So I followed it for years. And I felt like I always knew I would write a book based on that, but I also knew I had to grow up as a writer before I tackled it. Because there's a lot that goes into but uh, for me, there was a lot that needed to go into writing a book on such a serious matter. Are real life events far more frightening than anything that, that Lori Roy can dream up in her mind? Um, so far, yeah. yeah. Uh, they, I, I have, my work has been at least loosely based. I'll accept the, my debut, uh, Bent Road. Um, I wrote a book inspired by the last lawful hanging in the United States, which took place in Kentucky in 1936. Um, so yeah, I, uh, there's, there's plenty to mine in the headlines. What makes a good book? Or what makes a book good? Well, I want it to have it all. Um, I like a great plot. I mean, we all want, we all want to have that. I, I have to stay up tonight and keep turning the pages. But I also want a great setting. I want, you know, a wonderfully well-rounded, warm to the touch characters. And I want the book to matter. Um, that's what I spend a lot of time looking for, is what's that thing in the book that Matt, why, why would anybody spend time reading my book, is what's always going through my head. What's your process? Once you, the research is pretty much behind you, do you have a daily discipline? Um, I used to be able to say yes. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, I do, but it's sort of a, I describe it as controlled chaos. Uh, mm -hmm. When I'm working on a first draft, I do set a target of word count for myself every day so that I just sit down and do something. It's, remember that feeling like when you had homework, particularly if you had a paper due? Um, that's, that is a writer's life every day. I got homework. Um, but then I do a lot of research. And that accumulates all over the house, in my office, under the car seat, um, and just sort of, once it all feels like the wheels are about to come off, that's when I know I almost have a book. You're never off the clock. Uh, no, not really. You ever had a character that you loved so much that you thought, I can bring her back? You know, I haven't yet. Um, yeah, I, I, some of my friends are, are series writers, and great and brilliant series writers. And so I have a lot of respect for the skills that go into that. And at this point, I don't believe that I have those skills. I, I mean, I know where my strike zone is. And uh, now if one came along, I, I certainly wouldn't be adverse to it. But uh, Lori, yeah. can we do a little literary lightning round? Oh, we can try. OK. <laughs> Okay, let's start with the favorite books as a kid. The Outsiders is Hinton, one of the first. Essie Hinton, love that book. Yes, and then I went on to watch the movie and like had my first crush. Um, uh, so that's one that, I, that always comes to mind that was my first favorite. A book that made a, such a deep impression on you. Um, well, To Kill a Mockingbird, which we talked about, uh, John Steinbeck, uh, pretty much any of his work, particularly East of Eden, that book particularly. That's a great book. Mm -hmm. Also a great movie. Yeah. Uh, any particular book that you would like to give as a gift or that you have given as a gift? Most recently, I gave Reese Witherspoon's Whiskey in a Teacup as a gift. <laughs> which is great. It's a, it's a cookbook and, uh, and uh, memoir. Uh, uh, yes, yes. You scare us all the time whenever mm -hmm. I pick up one of your books. So what scares you? Um, boy, uh, 
all the things we've been talking about <laughs> have uh, scare me. Yeah, and they, uh, and I, maybe that's why I write about them. Do you read your reviews? Um, some of them, some of them. I, I'm not gonna lie and say, no, I don't read any of my reviews. <laughs> um, yes, I do. I, I, if, um, if I feel like it's not going well, I don't. Uh, which I'm fortunate that I haven't had uh, many of those. But... I read the reviews for Gone Too Long and they're all good, so you don't have to worry about anything yeah. like that. <laughs> Gone Too Long is Lori Roy's fifth book, Beyond the Secrets and the Hate and the Prejudice. It really is a story of survival. I'm Ann Bocock. Please connect with us and join me on the next Between the Covers.